Hare Krishna, Arulna Mataji. Thank you very much for joining the Monks Podcast once again today. We also have Russell here, Prabhu here with us. He's kindly joined once again. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Russell Prabhu. So Mataji, I thought today we would discuss about this topic of women's social and economic roles in society. We had some discussions uh, separately during our email and WhatsApp exchanges. And I also heard a couple of your talks. So the way you frame women's and social roles in terms of Varanashram is quite striking. So I'll just quickly paraphrase my understanding what I had and then maybe you can elaborate on this. So quite often on one side, uh, sometimes some people pers- uh, that, that some people perceive that if there is a Varanashram structure, there would be no role for women or women would simply be rele- relegated to the role of homemakers. And some people resent that, some people insist that, and that leads to polarization. But what you ex- explained, right, if Varana is concerned more with, say, uh, professional or occupational role, and Ashram is concerned more with like family responsibilities, or the particular then, then in the past, both were integrated naturally. And that's why women could contribute in the family as well as in the, as well as in a professional occupational role. But the industrial revolution sort of made it difficult to do both together. So can you elaborate, if my understanding is right, and if you can elaborate on it, if it is. You have already summarized the whole podcast. Now nothing for me to say. <laughs> no, no, no. I just <laughs> thought I should talk, I, I, because we have discussed this earlier, but it was a very, the first time you mentioned it, there are some things which we hear, and then we need understanding to, uh, to actually, we need a further discussion to understand it. But there are some things which uh-huh. we hear for the first time and they strike us as so intuitively true. We would like to know more about it, but just that insight is so intuitively striking. So in that sense, it struck me. That's why I started by paraphrasing it. So, but you could please elaborate on it. Well, why don't we start with, with something that Srila Prabhupada said. Uh, he said, that's what I, similarly weaver, that cloth weaving, cut, cut. The wife is spinning. Her husband is weaving. The children is weaving and combinedly at the end of the day, there is a cloth and people were satisfied with simple necessities. They would not charge very much for the labor. This was a room conversation in uh, July 14th, 1977 in Vrindavan. Then another quote, I have seen in India still in your country. Also, you'll find the potters during Diwali system. They make small dolls. So I have seen the potter's house. The children, five or 10 years old, they are also making small dolls, small dolls, because by tradition, by family, the father is making doll, the mother is making doll, and the children also learning. Similarly, the weaver you'll find. Lecture Srimad Bhagavatam, 1104, London, November 25th, 1973. So that's an example, of course, in the uh, varna of the artisans and the craftspersons, uh, but we can find examples in all of the varnas. We find examples that uh, just like we are calling uh, them gopis. What does gopi mean? Beautiful. Huh? The cow herd. So what does gopi mean? Profession in one sense. Yeah. Exactly. What does it mean? So, yeah. Sorry, and, 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 yeah. Sorry, I was thinking they, even the are, Brahmana Patnis, they were assisting their Brahman husbands in their sacrifice. It's almost exactly. And they could yeah. not, exactly. And we find like in Krishna's Leela, there is the Leela where the gopis, they are called cowherd women. Yeah? Hmm. That is what gopi means, literally. Cowherd women. And we find that in Krishna's Leela, the gopis were going uh, across the Yamuna to sell their milk products in Mathura. Correct? Hmm. Yeah. Yes, and we also find in the Bhagavatam, there is this lady fruit seller. She is coming door to door selling fruit. Mm. Then if we look at uh, in the in government, in the Varna of government. Uh, so Arjuna had a wife, Chitrangada. She is described as a fierce warrior. We have Kaikeyi who was driving the chariot. Rukmini, who was driving the chariot, Prabhupada said Devaki knew how to play the political game. 
And it's very interesting when Srila Prabhupada is describing the mood of a Kshatriya, the mood of a person in the government Varna. So this is again a quote from Srila Prabhupada. He says, this spirit of Kshatriya was prevalent even, say, 300 years ago in India. There was a king, Yasomantasena. He was the commander-in-chief of Emperor Aurangzeb. So in one fight, he was defeated and came back to his home. So his wife heard that, quote, my husband has been defeated. He's coming back home, unquote. So she asked the caretaker to close the door of the palace. So when Yasomantasena came there, he saw that his palace doors closed. Then he sent message to the queen that, quote, why have you closed the door? I've come home, unquote. So messenger came and informed that the king has come. So he is asking to open the door. The queen replied, who is king? Yasamanta Sena? No, no. Yasamanta Sena cannot come home being defeated. Yasamanta Sena, either he conquers the battle or he lays down his body there dead. So the man who has come, he must be somebody pretender. He is not king Yasamanta Sena. So she refused to open the door. This is the spirit of Kshatriya spirit. This was a lecture by Uvid Gita 2, 33 to 35 in London, September 3rd, 1973. So it's, I found it very interesting that when Prabhupada's giving an example of the mood of the Kshatriya, he picks the woman. And of course, as you were saying with Brahmanas, you know that the uh, so, Brahmanas- so, 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 Hold on one minute. So this, yes, example, yes. this example I've heard before, but what you're saying is that, so to illustrate the Kshatriya quality, the Kshatriya quality says, Yudhe Chapya Palayanam, that a Kshatriya does not run away from a battlefield. And if a Kshatriya has run away from the battlefield, in one sense, the, the male might not be exhibiting the quality, but here the female is exhibiting the appropriate Kshatriya quality that she is saying that right. this king cannot be, this king is not actual Kshatriya. So she is exhibiting the example of a kshatriya, what a kshatriya quality should be. That's a nice exactly. analysis. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then, of course, we have Prabhupada says that the Brahmanas, they have to perform yagya with their wives. And we know that uh, many of the Vedic hymns uh, were composed by women. Uh, Romasa, Lopamudra, Apala, uh, they composed the Vedic hymns. They're listed in the, in the four Vedas. Mm. We have uh, in the Bhagavatam, it's explained how Kasyapa Muni, he was engaging Aditi in deity worship. Right? He gives her whole elaborate, he says, are you tending the sacrificial fire? Are you engaged in worshiping the deity? So this was also done. Okay. Yes. And so we, we see uh, in the Shastra that uh, women have varna and ashrama. Everybody has bhakti. Bhakti is for everybody. Bhakti, whether you are brown or black or white or green or purple, or whether you are male or female or old or young or healthy or not healthy, or you are intelligent or you are foolish, bhakti is for everyone. That, I hope everybody agrees with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, I don't think there's much doubt about that. Uh, I don't know. i not sure if everyone even agrees with that. Uh, but uh, Varna, everybody also has Varna and Ashram. Everybody, men and women. So sometimes people have a view that women have no Varna and that they only have the Grahasta Ashram. Uh, so we can talk about each of these. We've talked a little bit now about Varna. So people also think sometimes that women's okay, so Varna so just, is by... So just, if, you yes, yes. So if you can just... So women also have a Varna... So this you have inferred from the fact that women are engaged in a diversity of professions based on Correct. various references that we are seeing. So here, Correct. if you consider Varana, what you are, uh, Varana, you're referring basically to the, you know, broadly we're equating with it the profession or the qualities associated with a particular profession. And because yes. those, like, those engagements are there or those particular dispositions are there, that's why we are saying that women have a varana. So yes. now, now this, the question comes up over here. Do the women just adopt the varana of their husbands and assist them? Or the, do the women have a varana that is independent of their husbands? Because in all these situations, very, we, we basically see question. that the women are simply assisting their husbands in what they are doing. Well, I, that in the ideal 
society, men and women marry who are already determined to be of the same varna before marriage. Now, in modern India, this has degraded to some birth consideration. Yes. So even in modern India, uh, the parents are very concerned that the boy and girl be of the same caste. But that is caste by birth, and they have lost the whole purpose behind it. So Krishna says, Chaturvanda Mayasra Sam Guna Karma Vivagasam. It's according to your qualities and your work. And so you see throughout the Bhagavatam, throughout all of the Vedic scriptures, there was great care that the man and woman be of the same varna. And Krishna says this to Rukmini, the husband and wife should be equal. Hmm. Yes? So this cannot be by the woman's birth. That's not possible. Sorry, Krishna doesn't have another verse. The, they are equal. Where is that reference exactly? That is in the 10th canto when Krishna is uh, teasing Mini and he's saying you should go marry someone else. Oh, in that context. And he okay. says, I'm not equal to you. Okay, okay. Yes, correct, correct. Okay. And he says the husband and wife should be equal. They should be equal in, in, in everything. Uh, I, one thing is that Prabhupada translates it that they should be equal in renunciation. And that also is a little indicative of Varna. And I tell people who are thinking of marrying, you know, marry someone who is equal to you in renunciation, and that this is most important. And Prabhupada also, there's a number of purports where he talks about how the astrology is done to determine the Varna. Because in those days, uh, people were married very young. Both the girl and the boy were married very young. And so seeing the qualities you could observe, but you would also have to look at the horoscope because they were not old enough to really uh, manifest so much of their own qualities. So, of course, one looks at the family also, even in modern marriages, people consider the family. <laughs> uh, but family is not everything. Like Robert says, you know, if there's a girl of a good quality from a bad family, then you can accept her. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely not by birth. And it's also interesting if we think about Kardama Muni. So Kardama Muni was a Brahmana and he was praying to the Lord, please send me a girl of like quality. The word is Sama, uh, equal quality again. And so Krishna said, yes, I am going to send you a wife who's compatible with you. And he sent the daughter of a Ksatriya. Devahuti was the daughter of a Ksatriya, but she had the mentality of a Brahmana. The Lord says, mm. I'm not saying, Krishna is saying that she had the same quality. And we saw that she was able to live in austerity in the forest. I mean, later, Kardama, by his mystic power, was thinking, oh, she grew up in such opulence. Let me give her opulence in this uh, flying city. But the Lord himself said, yes, this is a girl who is compatible with you. So that means her quality was different than that of her parents. She had her own quality. And we also see that uh, the woman does not automatically take on the qualities of the husband if the varnas are different. But just like Ajamila, so he was married to a, a Brahmani lady. And then he got involved with a Shudra lady. And the Shudra lady did not become a Brahmana by marrying Ajamila. <laughs> Oh. She did not change and become, if, if it is true that women are just blobs, you know, if you, if we want to say all females are just nothing, they have no qualities, they have no personality, they have no inclination, they're just blobby things. <laughs> and whoever she marries, she becomes whatever the husband is because she has no uh, personality or qualities of her own. Now, we, we should think about what does this mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. what are we what are we implying but it's not the case therefore you have pratilom and anulom marriages because mm -hmm. what is the meaning of pratilom and anulom marriages if the woman becomes like the husband after she marries but she doesn't and you have also you know Vasudev and Nandamaraj are half brothers they have the same father but Vasudev has a Ksatriya mother and, and Nandamaraj has a Vaishya mother you will also see that when there is a difference in Varna, and this is quite interesting in the Bhagavatam, 
generally the child is identified by family in terms of the mother's varna. Like Ramaharshan Sutta, his father was a Kshatriya, his mother was a Brahmana, and he was identified more as a Brahmana. And this is, uh, Vidura was identified more as a Shudra because his mother was a, a servant girl. So it's, it's quite interesting to me that if the Shastra looks at family and the family is mixed Varna, they look at the mother more. Yeah, even I think Anga's son Vena was considered to be, yeah. uh, his, he was considered to be a demoniac because of his uh, maternal oh. connection to some extent. Yeah. Yes, but that's not a Varna thing because the mother was also Kshatriya. So that's not a Varna thing. But oh, looking in terms of okay. Varna, looking in terms of one's livelihood, one's propensity for vocation, for career. Uh, my point is that if the woman just becomes whatever the man is, then you wouldn't find this. There's, then there's no meaning to Prati Loma and Unlo marriages. It, it has no meaning. Why is there this, this concept? The concept is there because the woman stays who she is. Okay. And therefore, I mean, therefore there was such care taken with that the husband and wife should have the same tendency towards livelihood. Now, what you're saying also is so significant that the examples that I was giving, the woman's career was completely connected to her service to her husband. So the husband is taking care of cows. Let's go to of that. Cows. Sorry, just one point before that. You know, another way, I mean, just, I just want to explore this, that when you talk about Varna, if it's not just in terms of uh, of uh, psych of profession of occupational roles, but it's also in terms of internal dispositions. So each Correct. woman is also a soul, and the soul Correct. has its previous transmigratory journey. So it's not that all the impressions from the previous lives are going to be wiped off, and all of them are going to be either wiped off or subordinated to. Uh, like one particular disposition as a woman, that may be some overarching characteristics as a woman, and because the soul is in the female body. But in terms, if you consider varana in terms of the samskara, the impressions from previous lives, then just as within the male gender, the soul has diversity. I think even the female gender also soul will have diversity. So if you, from that perspective also, women not having their own varana doesn't make sense. Because is it that the souls transmit immigrate souls impressions on the previous lives that manifest only in one body and they're not manifested in another gender at all? Does that make sense? That would I mean? make no sense. Yes, what you're saying is perfect. Yeah, it's perfect. You know, and if the you please excuse me, but if someone says that uh, that all women are exactly the same. You know, that there's not some women who are artists and some women who are managers and some women who are scholars and some women who are agriculturalists. Uh, they are saying that women are simply matter. Well, yeah. They're, yeah. they're not, it, <laughs> you know. In one sense, it's, if, if somebody says all women are equal, well, then why, is, why are people so careful about whom they marry? If all women are simply exactly. interchangeable and equal, we don't treat it like that. We see each woman as an individual. Even if somebody is from a traditional perspective, they look at the horoscope. Contemporary perspective, look at uh, looks and other things, whatever it is. But we don't treat right. it as equal. I mean, as absolutely the same. You don't just say to your son, oh, you just picked any female, any female human walking down the street. You just pick her and she will become like you. She will become compatible with you after you marry her. It doesn't matter who you pick. You just blindly put your... We blindly walk down the street and any unmarried female, you pick, who's, who would have such an idea? Mm. And then there are people who will say, well, yes, yes, women have varna, but by family, not by their own qualities, which again, Krishna doesn't add another verse in the, Bhag in the Bhagavad Gita after, uh, you know, <laughs> guna karma, he doesn't say, but for women, it's just janma. Yeah, this leads to that other verse where it says, Ye maam partha vyapa shuddha ye pisyu papa yona, striyo vaishyasta shudras. There he seems to put striya as in a category separate from vaishyas and shudras. So that might suggest that uh, there is a overarching female mentality which uh, or a overall female disposition 
my understanding of that verse is that it it refers to a certain level of uh, we could say disqualification for vedic rituals and what krishna is saying is this is vaishya and shudras may not be qual- qualified for vedic rituals but they are pract- qualified for bhakti similarly women are not qualified for vedic may not be qualified for certain vedic rituals but they are qualified for bhakti it doesn't refer to say that is the it? women are out of the four uh, yeah. they are not separate varna is that your understanding also or you like to laugh yes exactly exactly and you can talk about uh duties for women as a class like you can talk about duties for men as a class because but then you're talking about ashram so 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 we've talked about varna and, and why don't we finish exploring varna before we go to ashram yes sure. so when you if you're going to talk about differences between male and female first of all there's always some individual outliers but if we're going to talk about general duties for men and general duties for women then we're we're looking much more at ashram than we're looking at bar uh but we'll we we'll, we can get to that hmm. uh if we go on because there's another objection people make sometimes people say well yes it's not just the family and women are not all just the same it's not that every woman is the same as every other woman but so women have different dispositions but they have no actions so they'll say women have the guna of varna but not the karma of varna so we've already looked at these quotes where prabhupada is talking about the women actually working in the livelihood with the husband so not just the disposition mm. uh, but also the act about this i always ask this question suppose you have some propensity in a certain area because the guna of varna means what you love and what you are good at what makes you feel that you are fulfilling your destiny that you are being who you are that is what varna means true that is what the guna so let's say you have this guna but you cannot act on it so you have the nature of a crafts person or you have the nature of a person who works in government and protects others and you have the nature of a scholar or you have the nature of an agriculturalist but you're not allowed to do anything how would you feel very suppressed yes what else it's it's just unnatural it's choked krishna is basically saying shreyans act according to your nature so it it doesn't uh, it it seems to be anti scriptural also to some extent absolutely and what kind of a god is it who would want to frustrate half of the human race oh that's a nice leap what what is the mentality of of a god who gives a nature and propensity and desires to half of the human race and then tells them but you cannot do it like you personally you are a scholar you are a teacher you are a writer so suppose you that you are told no no you you cannot do that you have to simply weave cloth mm mm-hmm. so i think this is how, how do, yeah so how do you feel so, yeah. so they are the people who are saying that all women only have domestic duties only have cooking cleaning sewing child care that is like you know still in india most people they have a domestic servant at least one mm. correct yeah used to be in the west now in the west we are poor the indians are richer actually <laughs> uh in 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 america only the very rich people have domestic servants but in india practically have all but the poorest people they have So if somebody is coming in they are doing the laundry they are cleaning the floor maybe they are cooking maybe they are watching children maybe they are doing some of the shopping so they are saying that women's duties are only that that means they are saying that every single female only can do the work of a domestic servant My. that's all nothing else mm. if she's naturally an agriculturalist or a, or a cowherd or she is naturally a weaver or she is naturally a scholar doesn't matter she has to work as a domestic servant and they're saying this is the law of god so then what is this god this reminds me of in the former soviet union 
when the when Stalin, you know, he killed all these scholars and the government people, and he made everybody work as as laborers. Or in the communist China, where they would just assign people to different work, never mind what their propensity was. So what a cruel God is this? And then as you're saying, I think this is very important. Krishna says very strongly, you must work according to your nature. And he says, better to do your own duty, even if imperfectly, than someone else's duty perfectly. He says, if you do someone else's duty, by avaha, your work becomes a vehicle of fear. Oh. I've also asked so many people in the world, when we want to talk about what is perfection in spiritual life, we could describe it as self-realization. I realize my true nature as a soul. Maybe I'm in the spiritual world. I'm a cow or I'm a, 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 a coward boy or a gopi or something, you know, tree. And I realize what is my nature. And then I do it for Krishna. Is that an accurate description of our idea of perfection? Yes, definitely. Okay. So that is also our idea in terms of our present false identity. That I find what is the nature I have in this life, mm -hmm. physically, mentally, and I do it for Krishna. Okay. So, so I, yeah. except, except in an emergency, except for a brief emergency, Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita are very clear. Krishna is very clear. Everyone should find out what is their nature and use that in Krishna's service. Mm. So if you're saying that every single woman has the nature of every other single woman and it is only to be a domestic servant, then this is not the teachings of the Shastra and it is not India's glorious history and glorious tradition. Mm. So I think this is where your point is coming in, that on one side, what you're saying is we have to accommodate and even not just we have to, but scripture accommodates uh, even women according to their nature engagement. Whereas in today's world, people have this concern that, oh, then the domestic responsibility is taking care of the children will be neglected. So mm -hmm. well, go to that that's now that how these two don't yeah. have compatible, but they were in, they, they are in some ways they have become in, that their incompatibility is in one sense, uh, is a recent historical phenomena. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Because one of the main reasons why you wanted compatibility of Varna was for psychology, right? You want a woman with a Ksatriya psychology married to a man of Ksatriya psychology because a Sudra doesn't have the psychology. I, I can't, I have to win every battle. You know, it would, it, it would be uncomfortable. But the other reason is so there's not a conflict between the home responsibilities and the career responsibilities. Prabhupada's talking about how the husband and wife are making the dolls together. Draupadi uh, in the Mahabharata, she tells Sachibama, she said, I am the only one managing the treasury. She was like the secretary of treasury. She said, I, I'm the only one who knows what money's coming in, what money's going out. She said, and I am managing the royal household of 100,000 people, which is a small city. So Draupadi was acting as the Ksatriya as an assistant to the husband. Mm. The gopis in Vrindavan, they're acting as Vaishyas in assistance to their husbands. The Shudra women, they're acting as artisans, craftspersons, tradespersons in assistance to their husbands. The wife is acting as a, as a brahmana, as a scholar, as a teacher, in assistance to the husband. This is the other reason why the marriage should be compatible. So this was the situation in the world for thousands and thousands of years. Even today, we still talk about, at least in the West, mom and pop businesses. Mm. You know, there's the, the bakery in town. It's, it's a mom and pop business. 
Sometimes they, this is uh, uh, basically another way of saying a small local business. It's a mom and pop business. Everyone knows some family that runs a farm and that it's been in the family for generations and the wife is working on the farm, the husband is working in the farm. Everybody knows family businesses, family farms, family trades. So we know that Srila Prabhupada often linked Varnashram to a more agrarian society. And I always wondered about this because in Vedic times, there were also cities, of course. So why did Srila Prabhupada have this link? So if we think about what happened with industrialization 150, 170 years ago, industrialization meant the industrialization of career. Industrialization pulled career out of the home. And the first career it pulled out of the home was textiles. So formally, like Prabhupada is describing with the weavers, you know, the wife is spinning, the husband is weaving, children are weaving. But this was taken out of the home. Okay, just, just a minute if I may pause. So what you're saying is in the start, you started with the quote of a weaver. So in one sense, earning one's profession or earning a livelihood was a combined family endeavor. And even the yes. farms, we could say that even the children would sometimes assist, the wives would assist. Sometimes. So, yeah. Yes. So now, by industrial revolution specifically, because it's a huge phenomena, can you, maybe when you're talking about textiles, you could give an example of what you mean by how the industrial revolution disrupted that? Well, work went from home to factory, from home to office building. Okay. And then if the... Like Chanaka Pandit says, a man is happy if he doesn't have to leave home to go to work. And especially he says, if, a, if somebody has to go to a foreign land, then that's considered a sign of bad karma, actually. That... Actually, yes. Yeah, okay. Always there were some, like we find the fruit seller, she was going door to door selling. And of course, there's always people who travel by ship or something as, you know, a tradesperson or caravan. But the general populace, they were working from home. And the family was earning the livelihood together. Also, there was extended family. So we had two things, pre-industrial revolution, extended family and working from home. Extended family means that the wife doesn't have to do all the cooking, all the cleaning, all the house. She has mother-in-law, sisters-in-law, uh, older nieces, nephews, so many people, and servants, of course, mm. also. So, I mean, aristocratic women, like my, my family was in, in America. They were very aristocratic and wealthy. And my mother didn't have to do domestic duties. She had servants. Mm. So, so what are you trying to make the point that they had... And people working from home. When you say they had servants, and, you're saying that... Uh, that a woman's working was did not interrupt with the domestic duties or her domestic duties did not consume all her time and she had other time. What was the point you're trying to make by that? Yes, she had time to work on a livelihood with her husband. Okay. So what has industrialization done? It has split up the extended family. Yeah. Because people had, because work was no longer home, people had to move to the industrial centers to work. And so the families were split up. And also the nature of industrialized work, it doesn't require the large family. And, and industrialization took away the roles of servants. Instead of somebody, a servant, you have a washing machine. But washing machine is not the thing. Uh, just like we have a mutual friend. Uh, he is Indian, but, but raised in America. So he married an Indian girl who was raised in India. And when they got married in India, she said to her husband, I want at least 15 children. <laughs> so she came to America. And after living with her husband in America for a short time, she said, I cannot have more than two or three children here in America. And he said, why is that? And she said, well, in India, somebody comes, they collect the dirty laundry, they wash it, they dry it, they iron it, they fold it, they put it away. She said, here, I have to collect the dirty laundry. I have to sort it. 
I have to put it in the washing machine. I have to take it out of the washing machine. I have to sort it again. I have to put it in the dryer. I have to take it out of the dryer. I have to fold it. I have to iron it. I have to put it. So the industrial revolution, it replaced servants with machines. It broke up the extended family and it took career out of the home. Mm. Now, number of big changes and huge. A, now you are putting this to a very specific rather than saying it simply as modern and pre-modern it is a, we could differentiate that way also but it's not just modernity in one sense it's a specific no. uh, socio-economic uh, socio-economic uh, change that or event or could, phenomena that has brought about this change correct mm. now let's think about the effect so, of industrialization go back that, that's why in one yeah. sense uh, that when what Prabhupada talks about, say, the role of women, uh, and that is something which is, in many ways, very similar to what we hear about, in, say, in Europe or America relatively has a uh, short history, uh, just a few hundred years. But if you talk about medieval Europe also, from whatever I have read, even women had, uh, that, that women could work from their homes, that does seem to be, uh, seemed to be a phenomenon that was global moralists. Correct. Mm. It was. And even fact- you see, even you see, you know, very, very common globally, like there's a shop downstairs and upstairs there's the residence. Okay. Yeah, that's true. That's very common. Very common. In today's world, if somebody has that, it's like a luxury for them. It's not very common. Yes. To we have it's, your it, workplace and your home right next to each other. Well, we can talk about this at the end when we talk about how we can go forward. Yes. Uh, but if we think about these three changes, the loss of servants, the replacing of servants with machines, the breakup of the extended family, and the moving of career out of the home. So these three things had a huge effect on everybody. Um, We're not going to discuss this much today, but it had a huge effect on children and children's education. We could talk about that another time, perhaps. But if we think about, uh, if you want another podcast on this, how Krishna and Balaram were tending the cows from four or five years old. And how the children were trained in occupations at a young age. And because children had been trained in their family occupation, Industrialization pushed children into factories where the children were competing unfairly with the adults because the children were being paid a fraction of what the adults were being paid, plus the children were getting injured. And that was the start of compulsory education until 16 or 18, whatever, all over the world. It was to keep the children from unfair competition. But what it has meant is that modern children do not start learning an occupation until they're like 18 or 20 or 25 years old. Mm. So there was a huge, huge effect on children and the children were much more separated from the family. They were much more separated from the village and the schools became run like factories. We changed from the one room schoolhouse where you had the same teacher all the way through and you were with mixed ages to being segregated by age. The people who started modern education were the same people who started the factories and they intentionally set up schools as factories. So there's been a huge effect on the children of the world. But for today's conversation, we're going to look specifically at the women. There's also been a huge effect on the men of the world. It's increased the stress of the men, the commute and so forth. And you know, like in India, they have this whole tiffin system where people bring the hot lunch from home to the men at work. <laughs> But when your work is at home, when you want to have lunch, you just go to your home and you have lunch. It's right there. But the biggest effect has been on women. And the reason for this is biological. Women have babies. It's it's just a simple biological fact. Whatever we want to say, the absolute difference between men and women is that women get pregnant and nurse babies and men don't. And that is just, no matter how you feel about genders and gender differences and gender similarities, that is, cannot change that. 
Yeah, that's just uh, so that is simply biology. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, Prabhupada would often use laws of God and laws of nature interchangeably. So if your career is at home and you have extended family and you have servants, then you can easily have a lot of babies. Pre-industrial society, average number of children was six. You can easily have a lot of babies and also do your career with your husband because there's so many people helping and is part of your life. And the children are also being trained in your career. But when you have to go out of the home to do your career, how is that going to be compatible with having babies? It's not. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, women could not be biological women and engage in their natural propensities in terms of their livelihood. For the first time in recorded history, women had to choose between using their psychological tendencies for their livelihood and the good of the world and their basic biological reproductive function. My God. This is what a choice. almost like inverting the narrative here. The convention, the mainstream narrative in the media is that in the past, women were inhibited, they were forced into just some particular roles in society. And now because of various, uh, various activisms and various forms of various forms of uh, movements for their liberty, now women are coming out and they are getting some breathing space. But what you are saying is that well, actually that, that loss of breathing some... space is itself a, the loss of breathing space itself is a recent phenomena. And and we are now. There are that certainly lens. some lens. We are. There are certainly some like that. But this is. Yeah. It is actually the opposite situation. In former times, women could fully be themselves. Hmm. And what industrialization has done has said you have to choose. Hmm. You're going to have to deny some part of yourself. So in the beginning of industrialization, biology won. It had to. In the beginning of industrialization, women had to give up their livelihood. They really didn't have much of a choice. Oh, okay. They no longer had the support of extended family. They couldn't leave home to go to work. And they were losing their servants, but they were still having a lot of babies. My great grandmother had 20 women. Really? My. Yeah, 18 lived to mature. 18 of them lived to mature. So if women are having, you know, six to 20 children, they had no choice but to have their reproductive biology win. There was no option. But these women were frustrated. A huge part of their nature and their personality was not being expressed. So you had some generations of very frustrated, unhappy women. Unless they had a nature and propensity as of a domestic servant. So some women, you know, all they want to do is cook and clean because that's their their nature. Okay, so then what happened? What happened starting around the 1920s was contraception. And by the time you come to the 1960s, 1950s, 1960s, there was all different forms of birth control. Mm. And then abortion became legal. But even before abortion became legal with birth control, women were now having two or three children. And school was compulsory before the children were trained in the parents' occupation. Most children were being educated at home or in small local schools. Now they're going to these big schools that are in, you know, there for so many hours a day. 
So all of a sudden, the women lost their biological necessity. Lost their birth control and abortion. Yes, because birth control and abortion meant you didn't have to have children. Okay. Or you could have only one child. So you say this pushed in India lost their biological necessity means that most people would consider they actually became free from their biological condi biological sentencing or biological that they subordination to their biology. So I, that that's the way the mainstream feminist narrative puts it that women were forced to they were freed from that. But what you're saying lost their biological necessity means that you're saying that on one side they lost. They lost part of themselves. Oh, so having a lot, having many children is a part of is a, the need to nurture and to care is a part of who they are. And of course, and that is just not in one sense they lost it in the sense that just circumstantially it was impossible to to actually take care of it, and that's why they also started using some technological intervention to stop it. But in that process, they lost a part of themselves. So in the beginning of industrialization, women chose their ashram duties over their varna duties because they had no choice biologically. They were forced. With the development of contraception and, and the legalization of abortion, women could choose varna over ashram. And that's exactly what they did. After several generations where their varna was repressed. In generations of women who were frustrated and unhappy, all of a sudden they could engage in their varna, but they had to do it at the expense of family. Yes, you know, I read. And just position make, make, forces them to choose. Oh, you know, I read recently about one from prominent sociologist. He says that among the three technological inventions that significantly change the world. That one of the one is the most, uh, like its impact is least understood. So first he said is like the nuclear bomb and second is the internet and a third is the birth control pill. So right. I mean the That's first true. thing we understand they rapidly change things, but now I'm understanding the birth control pill, how, how hugely consequential it is. Okay, we're an hour Huge. out. And that's why now Huge. we see Especially in the Western world. And the woman, the woman was in control now. The woman could take the pill every day. And she was now in control how many children she has. Mm. And that or if she has any children. Yeah, I mean, this. so many of the problems which we see, maybe you could call in the Western postmodern world or whatever, that there's a declining birth rate with much of the Western population, not even reproducing at a level which it could be sustained. So all this has come because of Varana being chosen over Ashram. Correct. Mm. And in one sense, within the mainstream feminist narrative, this is considered to be like a liberation. So they thought that, oh, forcing a woman to choose her Ashram instead of her Varana, that is her subordination and domination by the patriarchal order, uh, by, patri patri by the patriarchal order, and the capacity to choose Varana over Ashram is her freedom. And in that process, the in one sense, the ashram role of the woman is quite minimized, trivialized, even uh, demonized. So, Correct. so, but that is, that is very, you could say, destructive for the future of humanity. That is quite unfulfilling. Even for it's women It's so themselves. destructive. I mean, it's destructive beyond belief. It's destroyed marriage. Destroyed it. Prophet says marriage is now an imagination in human society. It's destroyed it. You know, that statement, it's amazing how prescient it was. You know, maybe at the 1970s when Prabhupada wrote it in the late, late 1960s, it might not have exactly been true at that time, but it's remarkable how true it has come out. That statement in the 16th chapter of Prabhupada, I think 16th chapter of Prabhupada, Prabhupada says it, isn't it? That's amazing. And my own personal conviction is that Chila Prabhupada saw in the 60s and 70s what would be the future of family and social construction. And this is why he kept talking about how women should be protected and why there should be early marriage and why women should take care of the children in the house. 
Mm. Because he saw that going in this direction, choosing Varna and neglecting Ashram would destroy the very fabric of society. Yeah. It's it means we, we don't have a societal structure anymore. For people to be on their second marriage now is completely normal. Third marriage, we roll our eyes. So sorry, so I'm just trying to understand that uh, this multiple marriages, how are they related with the, say, the choosing one or actually? Because, we, because you're, not, you're not developing family anymore. It's not very important. Your own developing your own career and your own thing, that is what's important. Yeah. And we see even, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but, you know, even the very educated Indians, they don't get their, their daughter married till she has a master's degree. Yeah. yeah, we'll come to that a little. I mean, that's the important point you're making. Just recently, so this is the yeah. So this is the yeah the tendency. So people are marrying late, and I am sorry to inform people they are not necessarily being celibate until they are 28 years old. That is true. Very true. You know, I I was saying this uh, to a friend of mine the other day. We can go to that late marriages or early marriages a little later. I just wanted to elaborate on this. We we'll just discuss a little bit about this point. I'm just so amazed by this analysis. So when, when Prabhupada is talking about emphasizing ashram over varana, if we do not have the broad holistic picture, in one sense, we may think that Prabhupada is actually forcing women back into, he's, he's against the women having their space and having their uh, varana propensity. But that's because we are looking from a limited historical perspective. So Prabhupada... Yes. Not denying yes. the one of a woman when he was emphasizing the ashram of the woman. Correct. Hmm. And people think we want to go back to 1950. Hmm. True. Okay. People think we want to go to 1950 right before everything exploded. You know what is similar here is uh, if we look at Ishopanishad. Mm. Where Ishopanishad is saying you have to have spiritual and material side by side, you must. Yes. So Prabhupada, in his purport, he's not emphasizing the side by side. Prabhupada, in his in his purport, he's emphasizing you must have the spiritual. Why? Because he's speaking to a materialistic society. And you had Prabhupada's followers who read that and said, "Oh, we don't need the material." We don't need to teach our children history and geography. We don't need to have an honest livelihood. All we need to do is chant Hare Krishna. So Prabhupada was trying to correct an imbalance, like he says in the first purpose of ISKCON. He's trying to correct an imbalance of values. And when things are all the way over there, then you, you're going to push them this way. Mm. So sometimes the if we don't understand the context in which Prabhupada was speaking, then we may, we, may, we may actually, in one sense, uh, misunderstand what Prabhupada wanted in terms of posterity or in what he wanted in the moment. Yeah, that is true. If, in, when Prabhupada is talking about Varnashram, this means women also have Varna, but they have it in the context of family. Yeah, you know, when you just cited... And Prabhupada, Prabhupada could see that... And, and who gets harmed in this? In the, in the industrialized society where the women are delaying marriage, having very few children, going out of home to work, no extended family, who is harmed? The, the women and the children, I mean, the men are also definitely harmed, but the immediate harm is to the women. And Prabhupada had compassion. By, by you say immediate harm to women, it's what I've read is by the age of 40, 45, when a woman has a good career, but she has no family, no children. That's the time when they start feeling very lonely and they start feeling, what is the point of my life? Is that what you're referring to as by harm? Yes. Mm. The women get it, they get exploited by so many men or they are exploiting so many men. They're, they haven't put the time into raising a family. They haven't had that part of their life satisfied. So by going to the, by getting the Varna part satisfied, their ashram part is not satisfied. That is also in need of a human being, is to be satisfied psychologically according to one's ashram. 
Hmm. I mean, and then of course the overarching thing is bhakti that nobody's being engaged in bhakti, and so ultimately nobody's satisfied. But at least yeah. you know, Prabhupada used the term peace and prosperity 195 times. Really, peace and prosperity. Hundred. That's amazing. Peace and prosperity. And the first purpose of ISKCON is to check the imbalance of values. So we have a really severe imbalance in modern society. I mean, it affects men also. Prabhupada talks about how the man is, you know, waking up early in the morning while the children are still sleeping, coming home late at night when the children have gone to bed. And he said how, you know, he met one man that his three-year-old son didn't know who he is. Mm. So this... This is also affecting the men. There's, there's no question uh, that is affecting men. But the, the women are really, really suffering. Yeah, and even they, in one sense, you know, uh, I was, now, I'm just, your, your, your framework of foreign and national stimulated so many thoughts. For most men, men, even when they are very passionate about their career, career it's in one sense, their varana is for their ashram. Their varana yes. is not an end in itself. You know, I want to have a lot of wealth. I want to have a lot of financial security so that my family will be safe and my family will have all that they need. So in one sense, varana right. alone won't satisfy even men. What to speak of women. Correct. So Correct. And also, if you think in terms of varnashram, a person only engages in varna when they're grahasta. So in brahmachari life, you're trained for your varna. Prabhupada says that uh, the Gurukula is training in values of life plus specific training for a career. He says that in the um, in the second canto, that Gurukula means you get specific training for a career. So you're trained in your career as a brahmachari. Vanaprastha means retiring, and everybody in the world understands retiring means retiring from career. <laughs> That's everybody understands this. This is not some mm. some new idea. Uh, and of course, sannyas, you're civilly dead. Mm -hmm. So students, retired people, and dead people, they don't have a career. That's the career is, is for the married person. Now, nowadays, there are many men who work at a career just for their own wealth and status. Yeah. And they're not doing it for family. And then we're looking at another principle of Varna Dharma. One of the principles of Varna Dharma is sharing your wealth, not working only for yourself, giving in charity. Yeah. At least you should give in charity to a spouse. Yeah. And therefore, Bhakti Vinod Thakur said, because I wanted to earn wealth, therefore I married. He didn't say, because I have a wife, Therefore, I got a job. He said, because I wanted to earn wealth, therefore, I married. So the concept is, even for a very materialistic person, if you are earning wealth, you at least have to share it with your spouse and your children. At least that. At well, least well, that. Well, Thakur said this is very striking. I, I, could, I could look it up, but uh, okay, it's okay. one of his... I, I, I don't know. I, mean, I just remember it. So it's very striking. Yeah, in one sense, just you could take it the other way also, that there is a there is a problem of in today's world, especially among youth, male, male youth, almost a lack of ambition. A lot of male youth are, uh, are just they're satisfied playing video games and then watching all kinds of things on the internet. And so in one sense, the male, you could say psyche or nature is such that they want to take responsibility for a family. And the impetus right. for Varana comes from the ashram. Prabhupada, I think, would also quote Malthus that when a man is married, that's what gives him the impetus to work hard. He takes care of the right. family. Care of the family is the basis of economic development, Prabhupada would say. So, yes. so one sense this choice between Varana and Ashram, that is damaging, or having to choose between the two of them is damaging for the entire society. It's entire society. Entire society. If you want to look statistically, the people who do the most crimes, are they men or women? Sorry, most crimes? Most crimes, they are committed by men or by women? By them. Who are them? By men, by males or females. Who is the commits the most crimes? Oh, it's males. The jails are populated with males. Yes. And what age? Teenage, youth, youth especially. 
Yes. So like 18 or 15 to 30. And who gets in the most accidents, like car accidents, males or females? Again, males. What age? Really? What age? Okay, age, age. Yeah. I think again, it must be youth. Maybe they drive yes. under intoxication. Something similar. Correct. So, but if they are married, that is not the case. Really? Okay. Those statistics are for single, single young males. And girlfriend doesn't do it. Having a girlfriend doesn't change anything. You have to have a wife. Oh, so what you're saying is that like forces a person to take responsibility and grow up. And yeah. Correct. That's Correct. Mm -hmm. So this separating of Varna and Ashram for the woman has also devastated the male population and also devastates population in general. Nobody has peace and prosperity in it. Mm. And the children are neglected and they feel unloved. And there's so much, you know, mental disease, so much anxiety, so much depression. Mm. So, so it's just uh, ripple effect in society is huge. Mm. So, you know, these problems of society in today's society, especially they're well known, but many people would like to, or many people tend to put the blame for this on feminism. But rather than putting it on feminism, you have to go further back. It is not, because in one sense, feminism also resulted from a particular thing. So the cause Correct. is women having women choosing their career over their family. But the cause is women being put in a situation where they had to choose between the two. Exactly. Hmm. And to say to half the population, you must choose family and you must not be able to express half of your being mm. imagine you know imagine being told that you can only express half of who you are mm. yeah, this, is, this is so true it is that do so it's so rather so now if i mean if you have something specific we can discuss or we could go toward the, what would be the solution part? But you want to discuss something more about this because um, this is so many thoughts we can, so much you can explore in this direction itself. But how do you want to take this? Well, I mean, Srila Prabhupada definitely, he wasn't against cities and he wasn't against machines, but he really urged that we go back to a simpler way of life. Why? That was also one of the purposes of ISKCON. Hmm. One of the seven purposes uh, is to, especially for the members, to come together to learn a simpler and more natural way of life. I mean, where I'm staying right now, so my daughter is here and her daughter is here, her daughter, her daughter's husband and her two grandsons. So my granddaughter is living with her mother. And so her mother is helping take care of the children. Yesterday I was watching the children. It's a very simple example. So my granddaughter is an artist by by her varna she's a, a, a craftsperson she's uh makes pictures and she builds things she's expert in, in that and in uh, bhagavad gita verses for the temple so she is making these designs she's taking a bhagavad gita verse and she's designing a picture to illustrate this verse it's beautiful so here here, Krishna is the master, so that is why the devotee is, is sitting down and uh, the witness. So Krishna's expression is kind of neutral as the witness. Also the friend. So this is a person who's kind of mixed servant and friend. And uh, we also, the refuge. So we have the stairs leading up to him, the refuge, the resting place. He's sitting on this bench. So we have... Uh, so much of this verse is illustrated in a subtle way in this picture. And you can see the mock-up of how it's going to look as a sign. So then she also did all the work to work with a professional sign company to price out the sign, all of the different things that are necessary. 
Beautiful. Are paying her. They're sponsoring a sign. So that is paying for all the materials and working with the sign company that's printing it. And for, and then she's, you know, she's doing everything. She's doing the artwork. She did all the business aspect. She's doing the construction. And so yesterday I was watching my two great grandsons for about four hours so she could work on the sign. So because she has extended family, because she has her great grandmother here, therefore I can help watch the children so that she can also do this in the indication of her propensities. Mm -hmm. And I live two minute walk from her. So, you know, I'm, we're right there. And then uh, I go and often I have uh, dinner at her house. So I don't have to do all my own cooking. She does some of the cooking and I eat with them. So this is the, to return as much as possible to these three things, servants, extended family, and working from home. And most of this work she can do from home. Most of it she can work on her computer and design the art and make the phone calls while she's watching her children. Her house is very clean. She's an excellent cook. They all worship Krishna together. You know, she and her husband are initiated devotees. And this is what I see as the future. Restore these things. If we cannot restore extended family, then create communities that are like extended family, where people help each other where it's not that everybody has to do all the cooking and all the cleaning and all the job and give space for people, especially women to work from home. And what I've always told young women is do a career you can do from home. Like I know um, my godbrother, Seisha Prabhu, who's a GBC, he's a lawyer. Hmm. And one of his daughters has also become a lawyer. And like her father, she's in immigration law. And I said, why did you choose immigration law? She said, this is something I can do from home. Oh. She says, if I'm a trial lawyer, then I have to always be going out of home. As an immigration lawyer, I can work from home. Mm. You know, for many years, my husband and I ran a Gurukula school, but we ran the school in our home. We're very close, like, you know, right there. Like you have the mom and pop. Okay. So in one sense. Uh, COVID-19 has given us a big benediction is that so many people have discovered they can work from home. Hmm. And, you know, as far as possible to go back to a simpler lifestyle or that isn't dependent on going to an office or going to a factory. This is why Prabhupada said, make your own cloth, grow your own food, make your own cloth. I have good friends where the family keeps cows. And believe me, the women are just as engaged in taking care of the cows as the men. Hmm. You know, it's, it's a family thing. And the children, I have, I have, I was just uh, seeing a, a good friend of mine. So the children are learning how to milk the cows. The, the sons and the daughters, they are learning how to milk the cows. They are learning how to help the cows give birth. They are learning how to make all the different milk products. And they are also learning how to run the, the business end of it. And this is, this is where we need to go. This is the future. Mm -hmm. so, so this is, uh, so, so in one sense, you could say that, like Kunti Maharani says that just the Ganga always moves towards the ocean. Somehow she finds a way up, down, left, round, left, right, whatever. So in one sense, we, we are li living in a world which is very different from, say, the pre-industrial civilization revolution world. But within this world, we need to find a way in which we can actually balance Varana and Ashram. Uh, we can harmonize Correct. it together. And I think this applies, Correct. in one sense, also to ma males. Because even if men of choose course. a career which consumes all their time, and they have no time for family, then that also hurts. That that keeps them dissatisfied, that keeps their family dissatisfied. But especially, it, in one sense, in some ways, it is expected that men will prioritize Varana or Ashram. But it's uh, for women, both are in one sense important. That's why choosing this in a balanced way is important. Correct. 
But even for men, I mean, there's a, a seminar I give about how to, about prioritizing our sadhana and having good quality sadhana. And I quote from a palliative care nurse. Palliative care is when you're taking care of people who are actively dying, they're terminal. Yes. So she wrote about the five regrets of the dying. And she said every single working person that she dealt with, everyone regretted that they spent so much time at work and not with their family. Hmm. Everyone. So this is a big problem for men taking work out of the home. I was just visiting uh, our younger son and he has his, he has had his own business now for a few years. So he can set his own hours and twice a week, he works from home three times a week. He goes to an office nearby twice a week. He works from home. And, you know, like uh, even on the days he goes to his office, so he's driving the children to school and his, his son's, their school starts earlier. So his daughter's school starts like 15 minutes later. So he's playing games with his daughter before school. And, and I went with them on my way to the airport. And one other father came. His daughter was also there. And they were playing like uh, throwing catching games with their, with their daughters for 15 minutes. Uh, so because he's able to work from home and because he has his own business and he can have his own hours, he's able to spend a lot of time with his family. You know, and he's uh, his children are, are engaged in sports and he's some of the coaches for their teams. So he's able to to earn enough for his family. They live very comfortably. And at the same time, he spends a lot of time with his family. So they've been able to find that balance. And they have his uh, mother in law lives very close by. She's been widowed about four years. And she also will help with the child care and things like that. So she does like some of the accounting and the organizing of his business, which she can do from home. And before that, she was helping with her sister's business from home. So she's able to stay and take care of the children. And at the same time, you know, she's able to do things according to her nature. So I'm not saying their situation is perfect or that everybody should have some situation like that. But the fact is that there are ways in modern society to do this. Hmm. This really you know, there, are, there are sorry. Yeah, this really brought no, up the understanding of when Prabhupada said that he wanted Varanashram. It does it needn't be like a like an institution initiated community with neat divisions of varanas and ashrams. It could be also oh. an individual choice of balancing one's harmonizing or ba at least balancing one's varana and ashram. That could also be a step towards Please. fulfilling the essential purpose of varanashram. Please. Yeah. Institutionally controlled, designated. Uh, no, thank you. No, thank you. Okay. No, thank you. Been there, as we say in America, been there, seen that, done that. <laughs> uh, it, no, thank you. We will just simply say that. Uh, hmm. At Varnashram. Varnashra means that there's communities run by Ksatriya. Ksatriya means government. So God so if you want to the institutional, institutional authorities in one sense? No. A, a religious institutional authorities, the same as government, that is the antithesis of Varnashram. Hmm. How is the, that the antithesis? That religious institutional leaders should be Brahmanas, not Kshatriyas. It's not the job of Brahmanas. Okay. It's the job of Kshatriyas. I know we have uh, at least one leader in our Hare Krishna movement who says, yes, I am trying to establish Varnashram, but so far no Kshatriyas. So then this is, it's impossible. Prabhupada says only the Kshatriyas can actually establish Varnashram. Okay. That's interesting. You know, the Brahmanas can give the... guidance. Okay. The Brahmanas can give guidance. So if we don't have governments establishing these things, then at least on an individual basis, we don't have to wait for the whole world to become perfect because we may be long gone then. So at least on an individual basis, we can understand the principles of Varna Dharma and Ashram Dharma. And we can institute those 
principles in our lives as much as possible. Hmm. And the principles is that we are body, mind, and soul. And all of those need to be properly engaged in Krishna service. I need to have, every human being should have some time of yagya. Every human being should have a time of connecting with the Lord. That's what yagya is. Yagya is like a ceremony or a procedure of connection with the Lord. And everyone should have some regular time of focused, concentrated connection of the Lord. Again, it doesn't matter whether you're brown or green or purple or male or female or a eunuch or what you are. You know, everyone has some concentrated time of connection. And then everybody needs to function according to their biology and their psychology. That's also a fact. And again, it doesn't matter whether you're green or purple or brown or male or female or a eunuch or you're shorter, you're tall, or probably would say this. We need to engage our psychophysical nature in the service of the Lord. Krishna says we have to do it. He said you will not be able to repress it. What happens when people don't have some facility? That is true. So what you're saying Krishna, is Krishna said, if you don't do it for me properly, you'll do it improperly. Hmm. Yeah, 1858, 50 and 60 says that, yeah, don't do it for me. So, yes. so what you're trying to say here, if I understand right, is that it is uh, to some extent individuals or communities come together and they create the space by which uh, devotees can at one level attend to their, have some time for yagya and the spiritual side of their life, and then for the varana and the ashram to be balanced together. Mm. Correct. And so, done in the service of the Lord. That people should learn okay. how to dedicate their varana duties to the service of the Lord, and how to de dedicate their ashram duties to the service. Yeah. So, and so, they should be, all these three should be supporting each other. The yagya that we're doing, the bhakti, the yagya, that should be giving us the strength and the enthusiasm for our ashram and, and varna duty. Hmm. That is true. All three are meant to, to support each other. Like Prabhupada says, marriage is to make the mind peaceful so that one can engage in spiritual life. So all of these should support each other. So, yeah, that's right. That is a very striking statement of Prabhupada. You know, make the mind peaceful. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, so I'd also like to talk a little bit about women in the ashrams. Yeah. Just one point about this, about this work according to Varanas. In one sense, it's quite difficult for people to know their Varana also in today's world. It is. It is. In, so do you have any suggestions about that? Say, if, and we're not going to talk about Varana in general, but maybe. For women, well, that's another that would that could be another podcast. Uh, so I am I've been working now uh, four and a half years with a co-author Rukmini. Uh, that's Dr. Ruchira Datta uh, on a book on called Career Dharma: The Natural Art of Work, and that that is about the principles of Varna Dharma. So we're not looking so much at the details, but the principles. And we have a lot of it dedicated to knowing what is your varna, knowing, finding what is your propensity. I mean, if you also want to talk about how do we fix this in the future, well, one of the ways that we fix this going forward is helping both males and females to have some understanding of their varna by the time that they are teenagers. Okay. A person's varna can, the empirical research shows that the person's varna can be ascertained by the age of 13. Uh, in my own experience, I see that something of a person's varna is obvious even when they're three years old. You know, something of it is, is obvious. I, I give you a very simple example. I was giving a class, I can't remember what part of the world anymore. And uh, there were a lot of devotees there and some young children like two, three, four years old. 
So I noticed that there was one little girl, three, four years old, not more than four. And she was reading all the other children. She was telling them where to go and what to do. And she was engaging them and so forth. So after the class, I said, whose child is this? So one couple came forward and I said, your daughter is a natural leader. Please make sure you train her in leadership. And they said, oh, we are always trying to stop her. We are always telling her you're too bossy, you're too directive. And then I said, what do you do? So both the parents were leaders. Oh, okay. Both of them were leaders in, in bhakti and they were leaders in their career. Both, both husband and wife, Indian family. And when they told me what they did, I was laughing. I said, you know, mother and father are leaders in, in, in ISKCON and you are leaders in the, in the world and you think your daughter will not be a leader and you are trying to stop her. So this was evident from a very young age. And Often it is like that. There's something you can see from a young age. So this is the, one of the principles of, of Varna Dharma is that the parents, the teachers, that they help a person to understand their propensity at the beginning of their adolescence. Now, when there was very early marriage, the women were getting this training in their husband's family. Hmm. You know, but that was the nature had to be determined before marriage, because if the nature is not determined before marriage, you cannot have compatibility of Varna in marriage, which is a strong uh, item within the Shastra, as we were talking about earlier. True. But how to determine how to determine your your Varna? I will give a I can give a very short answer, but it will not be satisfying because it's it's not complete. Yeah. So, what's your fun? If you can do something for fun that engages you fully, where you practically lose yourself, you forget about time, mm. you don't want to go to sleep, you, you will skip a meal, you know, you get into a kind of samadhi the psychologists and sociologists call it a state of flow where you almost feel a union with the work that you're doing. You feel that what you're doing is an expression of your very self. Mm. And it's something that you do, whether people pay you or not, uh, whether you get criticized for it or not. It's something that we do without being asked. Sometimes we're not even aware of it ourselves. And it may be something that we got in trouble for as a child. That's quite common. I, I remember seeing a video is uh, this, this uh, gentleman that when he was in school, he was always getting in trouble for making noise. So he was He's always tapping on things and making noise. And constantly he was getting in trouble with his teachers. So when he was about 10 years old, one of his teachers asked him, you know, you stay after class. And he's, oh, now I'm getting in trouble again. And the teacher says, no. And he gave him some drumsticks. You know what are drumsticks? Mm. The sticks used to hit drums. Oh, not the edible drumstick. Okay. okay. No, 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 no. So, you know, even in Indian drums, there's a kind of two-headed Indian drum yeah, I know that, that they play with sticks. Yeah, yeah. And in the Western drum, they hit the drums with sticks. So this teacher gave him drumsticks and said, I want you to learn how to, how to play the drums. And he actually became a very famous drummer. Or like John Audubon, who was uh, a scientist studying birds. When he was a child, he was always looking out of the window. Hmm. And the teachers in school would, would always rebuke him. Stop looking out of the window. Pay attention. Pay attention to your studies. Stop looking out of the window. But he was a, a naturalist and a biologist and a, and a scientist. And, and speaking for myself, so I went to preschool when I was three years old. I started in preschool. 
And I remember my teachers would complain to my parents. So what do you think they were complaining about? What do you think was their complaint? You're leading the other children or you're like- Correct. Uh, well, not only leading the other children, I was trying to teach the teachers. <laughs> okay. So yeah, instead of just playing with the other, instead of playing with the other children, I was going to the teachers and I was saying to the teachers, look at what this child is doing in this and you should be engaging them in this way and you should be engaging them in this way. I was trying to train the teachers at three years old. And so the teachers were complaining and my parents were complaining. Okay. And my whole growing up, I was reminded of this all the time, in a, like it was something, a problem. My mother would always say, stop trying to teach. So until I was 24, I didn't know I was a teacher. I thought it was a bad thing. I was trying to repress it. And then I met my god sister, Jo Tirmayi, and she trained me how to teach. And what do I do now? I train teachers. I not only teach, I train teachers. So one way you can tell your nature is what got you into trouble as a child. Because the nature will not go away. And so your parents, your teachers, they may try to force you to be something else. But it's not possible because Krishna says you cannot repress your nature. So what do you do that annoys people? Is some indication of your nature. Something you do that annoys people that you cannot fix. That you cannot stop. It means you cannot stop it. You cannot fix it. Like uh, some years ago, there was a devotee who has a master's degree and he was working on a book of personality traits. So he asked all of us in the community to fill out these questionnaires to determine what is your personality as part of his studies. So I did that. And afterwards, he met with each of us and he said to me, Ermila, you cannot not lead So, you know, I had thinking for so many years, you know, oh, I, it's not good. I should just be quiet and, and sit in the back and keep my head down. But I couldn't do it. And, and after he said that, you cannot not leave. And anyone who looks at my astrological chart, they say exactly the same thing. So, again, this was an artificial choice forced between Varana and Ashram. And the- yes. Well, and, and just... Uh, you know, yeah. thinking like that. That is true. I was thinking about Varana. So, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, go ahead, please. No, it's just you know, it's like this with everybody. Mm-hmm. Some people, yeah. you know, some people leading is torture for them. Mm. I mean, we each have our. You were asking the question was, how do we know what is our Varna? What is it that we cannot not do? Yeah, that's true. You know, we have Russell Prabhu here with us. I think his varana is video editing. He has been silent throughout hearing. <laughs> Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how yeah. you discovered your passion. He's just in one corner of the world. He does editing for so many devotees. He does editing for the Melbourne Temple. And he loves it. In the small suggestion, small yeah, question, not... he'll be elaborate answer. Yeah. Yeah, I do get absorbed when I'm editing. Yeah. Mm. You've been doing this for and, how many years? Uh, uh, probably 50. 50? 50? Oh. <laughs> uh, Is yeah, it politically correct to ask like, how old you are? Is it? I don't know. How old am I? Uh, 66, I think. Oh, so right from your teens, you started this, is it? At early, yeah, tw- yeah, 20. And I did photography at high school oh, okay. as a craft subject. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's absorbing. 
it's everything that uh, you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. So how did you discover it? Uh, well, it's high school, I think. I just was, it was what I, well, I did it one year as a craft, but the next year I spent my physics lessons in the photography lab. Okay. And, just, <laughs> and they were okay with that. Mm. So, yeah, I was fortunate that I was exposed to it at school. Yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful. So, yeah, I'm sitting here listening to this, thinking, oh, yeah, I can edit this and I can edit that. And, <laughs> and it's good to have have the perspective of, of it all so clearly presented. That's nice. Mm. But, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's good. It's natural. Okay. Thank so you. a lot of the problems of things like feminism they just come from an incomplete understanding of what's going on. Mm. So, both, I think, feminism and the criticism of feminism both come from an incomplete understanding. Uh, yeah, yeah, lack of perspective. That's, yeah. Mm. When you get it, they're, they're not in non, non-issues anymore. Yeah. Your video editing is the best. Whenever people want to see any of my video classes, I say the ones from Melbourne are the best. Yeah, that's the. I've worked in commercial television for a while, so that's just because I used to do it for a job. So, and I've also been doing the editing the books, other bases, into long interviews. With um, the education ministry as well. Excellent. So I'm learning, learning lots from all, from all of the editing. And I think I like, um, I like what you're bringing up that it's something that you've done as a job and you're using it in Krishna's service, because this also relates that we should engage people in Krishna's service again according to their propensities. Yeah. Yeah. So it's um, yeah. I, I'm getting a lot of contact or association with all sorts of devotees through the editing. So um, I'm winning. Uh, it's good. That's wonderful. The two of us just are having a spontaneous discussion. At any time, you feel free to chip in. You know, we will not consciously ask you, but if you have something to say, please. We just raise your hand or just speak. Feel free to do that. Uh, so I think the two points which uh, which we which probably we said we just started discussing, but we didn't discuss at that time. So one point which you were making was about if marriages happen earlier, then that that helps in some ways. You are mentioning also how even Indian families marriages happen later. So one reason for that, uh, what I have seen is, it is also a concern for, you could say financial security or social security. If a woman has a proper degree, and then in case, in case the marriage doesn't work out, in case the, uh, there's some kind of some kind of problems, then there should be some kind of backup plan. That there should be, if they are educated, they have some experience, because it seems even in India, not in all families, but in many families. After a woman, even if, she, even if she's very well educated, after she's married, often the in-laws family expects the woman to maybe sometimes give up her job, take care of the domestic duties, uh, at least when she has children to at least take care of that sometime. So in that sense, it is a practical necessity. Uh, uh, that's what they feel it is a practical necessity. But also they know that it's like, a, a, then there's very narrow window left for getting the marriage right. Because if somebody says, I won't start looking for a steady relationship before 23, 24, 25, something like that, a little later, then the actual window in which a person can get married and then have children, especially for women, it seems to be, it becomes a very dicey thing then. So that's Correct. elaborate on that. Yeah, well, basically, if we're going to look at, at women now in the ashrams, 
So if we look at the Grahasta Ashram, again, if we look at biology and the laws of nature, uh, both males and females should marry young. If they don't, there is generally illicit sex in society. Biology will win. If, if someone thinks that culture and religion and law is going to win over biology, they are wrong. Biology will win. It's the law of God. And so what will happen is there'll be so many illicit connections. There will be illegitimate children. There will be abortions. There will be uh, psychological difficulty from this relationship and breaking in this relationship. But you can only have early marriage if women can develop their career after marriage and if there's extended family or extended support in a community. If you take those things away, then you cannot have early marriage. And if you cannot have early marriage, then at the time when people's desire and, and biological urges are the strongest, they're not going to have any facility for that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just like if you don't feed people, like let's say we have our, you know, some big temple like Mayapur, and let's say that there was no prasadam available anywhere in the whole complex. You could not find any prasadam, and people would bring their own food. I mean, it's just, it's just what it is. Or we see in parts of the world where people cannot get decent jobs, they turn to crime. It, 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 it Necessity will win out. I mean, there's uh, thinking that it won't is in some kind of a dreamland. If we're thinking that everyone in general is going to be fully transcendental, self-realized and not be affected by their biology. So this is it's, it's insanity, actually. Insanity. But this would be ideal for everybody if people, you know, you don't have this whole anxiety of dating and there's not all these illicit relationships, but this is not a popular thing to talk about. People are not, they're not inclined like that. Prabhupada talked about how, I mean, the dowries also become a, a, a terrible thing now in India, but Prabhupada talked about how the dowry was you were giving your daughter her inheritance at the time of her marriage and you gave her, what you gave her belonged to her. It did not belong to the husband that the parents' dowry for the daughter was never the husband's property. And it was in goods like gold jewelry and saris with gold thread in it and actual silver eating utensils. We used to call in the West silverware, spoons and forks and knives were called silverware because they were actually made of solid silver. I was just at a devotee's house. She was using the these things from her mother and grandmother and great-grandmother, and it's, it's real silver. And Prabhupada said, this way, if there's any difficulty, the woman has wealth. If she has wealth, that belongs to her. And if there's some difficulty, she can sell, or she can use. In the meantime, it's useful. It's not just like money in a bank account, you know, or, or bars of gold or something, but you're actually eating with the spoons and you're wearing the bangles and you're wearing the saris and you know, you're using the beautiful furniture. And if there's some difficulty, this dowry belongs to the woman. It's the woman's property. Prabhupada says, husband cannot touch it. I mean, it's used in the household if there's some beautiful chair or, or plates. And then it goes to the daughters in the family. So these things have all been twisted. Hmm. You know, now the men... The men are thinking, oh, the dowry is a payment to the men's family. And if you don't pay enough dowry, we're going to kill the girl. And it's horrible, horrible things. You know, but, and of course, the woman should have some training in a livelihood. Of course. Yes. As we say, you know, the women were also trained how to make the cloth or how to take care of the cows or how to run the treasury of the government or how to teach or how to do yagya. Hmm. You know, of course, it's like that. So it's all and I, ideally, there's also other people like Prabhupada's sister became widowed and then she lived with him. And we had a neighbor like that. Her husband had become widowed in a war and she lived with her brother. Her brother took care of her and her son. So again, this is extended family. If there's some problem in the marriage, you know, the husband becomes 
mentally unstable or the husband is, is criminally abusive or the husband dies or runs off with another woman or something, you know, then there's extended family. So the woman has her, her livelihood, her varna that she's developed. She has the wealth from her father's family. That's her possessions. And she has extended family. And this way, she's not in a difficult situation. And nowadays, women are having children without marriage. And the man just, we probably would talk about this all the time. And the man just leaves. And then the woman is in difficulty. And she has to kill the child. Or she has to get government welfare. And this is, this is not an improvement. I think you know, the whole marriage itself is a huge, complex issue in today's world. But I understand what yes. you're saying is that so how would, because we're talking more about Varanashram today, so how would early marriage, you know, we could talk about con, uh, the whole issue of uh, marriage itself and the very social problems that are there in a separate podcast, but how does early marriage help in help in balancing Varana and Ashram? Or are you talking about a different subject when you're talking about early? Well, no, no it, it's very related because... If you marry early, this is the time when you're developing your career, then naturally, if the husband and wife have similar psychology, then they're developing their career with each other from the beginning. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and the the natural need of the majority of people for the, the love of a romantic partner is taken care of, and that part of you is peaceful. Now, we should also just, just state for completeness that some small percentage of the population is not interested in career or family, ever. Mm. There is a small, small percentage of the population that does not want a career and does not want a family, ever. And, and that is true also for some females. So Srila Prabhupada would sometimes say that all the women should be married. And other times he was saying that we can have facility like the Christian nuns, where women who don't want to marry can live a life of austerity and celibacy. Really? So sometimes he would say like What Christian yes. nuns? I didn't know that. Okay. So it's a, it's a definitely a small minority. Okay. You know, like we have in our tradition, Ganga Mata Goswamini was like this. So it's, it's definitely a small minority, but it does exist. So I have one, one good friend, devotee friend, who never wanted to marry. And um, she said when she was young and, 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 and pretty, you know, people would always say, aren't you going to marry? Aren't you going to marry? And if she said no, they would argue with her. So she said she learned that when people said, you know, are you married? She'd say, well, not yet. And then they'd leave her alone. Uh, But she's always been a renunciate. She's always been just dedicated to the practices of bhakti. She's never had any kind of varna in the world. And you see this with, with some men and some women, that they have no interest in making a living. They have no interest in contributing to the world in an ordinary sense. They have no need of fulfillment for, from a career, and they have little or no desire for the gross and subtle aspects of a romantic or sexual relationship. I mean, there are people like that, and I, I, have, I have some friends like that. So that that should not be entered into artificially. It should not be entered into out of frustration. <laughs> um, you know, grapes are sour, uh, but that they do, those people, these people do exist. And traditionally, there's also been women like this. Again, the percentage is very small. And it shouldn't be something that's generally encouraged. Uh, but if someone is apparently like that, that that is also a possibility. Then in addition, even for the vast majority of people who marry, the idea is that by middle age, you everybody becomes renounced. I had the other day on, on uh, social media, somebody saying to me, women cannot be vanaprastha. And I said, how is it possible if the man, if her husband becomes vanaprastha, 
when he's 50, the wife must also be Manaprastha. How is the wife going to stay in the Asta Ashram if the woman is in the Manaprastha Ashram? Who is she going to be a Grahasta with? <laughs> you know, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. And we have, of course, in the Bhagavatam, so many descriptions of women entering the Vanaprastha Ashram. In the fourth canto, there's a story of King Malaya Dwaj and his wife, the Darby. And there's a whole description of how the woman lives in the Vanaprastha Ashram. And then we have like the example of Kunti, who was a widow, but she was practically living as a Grahasta, raising her children. And then when they grew up, she entered the forest also. She followed Dhritarashtra and Gandhari and entered the forest. And there's Archie and Prithu. When Prithu became Vanaprastha, Archie followed him as so many examples. So the, the woman also at a certain point, at least among the Ramanas and Satriyas, the woman also at a certain point takes up renunciation along with her husband. Uh, and that can be with the husband geographically or not with the husband geographically. Uh, Vanaprastha can be done together or separately or if the husband takes sannyas. So there's, there's also some concept that renunciation for women is not possible, but that's that's simply not true. It's not true shastrically, it's not true historically. And even if you look at ordinary people in the world, there's a tendency in the middle and toward the end of life to retire from work. And you know, the children have grown up and people will travel, you know, and they'll they'll that, that tendency is there among human beings. So that's also there, of course, for women as well. Mm. So in one sense, you're now talking about the progression of the Varanas from Grahastha to Vanaprastha. For, for no, women, I'm talking for about women together. So For both. Both, yeah, of course. Now, I mean, earlier you mentioned about some people who may have no no inclination, some very much small minority of individuals, male and female, who may have no inclination towards the world at all, world at all. I mean, even if somebody is in a renounced order, doesn't the varana still remain? They may not exactly engage in a profession. Because even as I'm a, I'm a brahmachari and I've seen the brahmachari ashram, all brahmacharis are not the same. Some brahmacharis would like to be more in managers. Some brahmacharis would more like to be in the more, more like teachers or Teachers are more... Well, if, if you will excuse me, if, if a person really wants to have a Varna, they should not be a renunciate. End of, end of story. Okay. If somebody wants to have a career, well, okay, wait a and, minute. They want to exhibit, and they want to exhibit their oh, Varna, but they're two different they things. should be married. No, I'm talking about Varna. So, See, Varna is in terms of, say, innate disposition, and second is in terms of the career. But Varna... But, but if you see, consider, even in our movement, there'll be some services which we'll be doing and we will innately gravitate toward particular services. So, so that, is, that is a different realm. So in the realm of bhakti, there are 64 angas. And Srila Prabhupada says in Nectar Devotion, chapter 16, that one should engage in these angas according to their particular taste. That one person may prefer to serve the deity, one may per person may prefer to be chanting, one person may be preferring to be hearing. And then, of course, one of the angas is service, and there are so many varieties of service. But if a renunciate should be satisfied doing only bhakti, only bhakti, no varna. Varna means I want to contribute to the world in terms of my propensities. So it means I want some livelihood from my propensities and I want to contribute to the world. And again, this is another discussion because in this discussion, uh, we would talk about, say, people who do kirtan in bhakti and people who are musicians by profession who dedicate their music to Krishna. So this is another discussion about what's the difference between acting as a grahasta in my varna and dedicating it to Krishna and being a renunciate and having a propensity for different services as an anga of bhakti and not as a varna. And this can be confusing, especially I see in the Brahmana varna and to some for some aspects of the Shudra varna. Because deity worship is an anga of bhakti and it's also part of the Brahmana varna. Similarly, teaching is like that. Of, yes, exactly. 
Yeah. So teaching the scripture could be an anga of bhakti, and it could also be a part of the brahmana varna. Oh. Right. Uh, singing songs about Krishna that could be an anga of bhakti, and it could be part of the shudra varna. So which is it? And it's important to know which it is. But that is another discussion on varna and bhakti. We're running out of time now. Yeah. That's another discussion of varna and bhakti in general. But in bhakti. If we can end on, on this note, there is much more scope in bhakti than in varna and ashram. Varna and ashram have to do with the body and mind. They have to do with the body and mind of this particular birth, as you were saying, from impressions from the last birth. And varna and ashram, without connection with Krishna, are not going to be satisfying. Because I talked about how they are an expression of the self, but they're an expression of the false self. So the only thing that's really satisfying is an expression of the real self. And expression of the real self is unlimited. There are unlimited ways to express the real self. And ultimately, we're not going to be satisfied by expressions in Varna and Ashram, even if we had a perfect Varna Ashram society. Ultimately, we're only going to be satisfied in Bhakti. And we are each individual's in such a deep way. Oh, thank you, my daughter, for bringing my breakfast. You know, the, the extent of individuality that we have in bhakti is again, unlimited. Every single jiva is unique. Mm. And the, the eternal service that we will do for Krishna in our spiritual form is unique for us. And even in this world, even in this body and with this mind, each of us has a, a beautiful and perfect service to do for Krishna. And to put, you know, some groups of people all in the same category, even each pujari dresses Krishna in a different way. Each cook is going to cook somewhat in a different way. And it's not that all males are going to do service for Krishna like every other male, or all females are going to do service for Krishna like every other female. This is... I, I'm sorry, it's impersonalism. Hmm. Personalism is, it, Prabhupada says, everyone should serve according to their particular taste. You know, I have friends who like to chant japa all day. I have friends who have been, for decades, they've been chanting 40, 50, 60 rounds a day. I have friends who study Shastra all day. I have friends who are on the altar and in the kitchen all day. You know, I have friends who are in the garden all day. So this is part of our individual nature. And some of that is going to be influenced by our psychology and physiology in this life. What service I do for Krishna. I'm not going to be doing construction work for Krishna in this life. I don't have the right body. And some of it will gradually, as we progress, have to do with our eternal nature also. And so this, there, there's no limit. There's no restriction. And in terms of our varna and ashram, that's going to be different according to our body and mind. But according to bhakti, no, it's not like that. And people who try to restrict some group of people in bhakti according to body and mind, they don't understand the difference between the body and the soul. So by my body, I have certain restrictions that I can do in varna and ashram. But for me as a soul, it's not like that. That, that's like the people who say those with white skin, they can't come in the temple. It's, this is a. Okay. At the very least, it's disrespectful and materialistic. So in terms of, of bhakti, there's no consideration. Male, female, old, young, black, white, green, whatever. You know, anyone can do bhakti. Sickly, healthy, smart, foolish. Bhakti is on the nature of the soul. Yeah, but still, most people will not be able to practice bhakti simply giving up their varana and ashram. And that's why this varana ashram, uh, base, uh, you could say varana ashram, I don't want to use the word foundation in the sense that uh, varana ashram has to be, in one sense, clear so that a person can actually focus on bhakti. Because this is very insecure. Yeah. And like earlier you quoted... And that bhakti, and that bhakti infuses their varana and ashram. They should be doing their, whether they're brahmachari, grahasta, vanaprasta, sannyasi, they should be doing it to please Krishna. Whether they're brahmachari, vaisya, shudra, they should be doing it to please Krishna. 
Mm. You know, whenever I see a person like I was just traveling and this lady was cleaning the floor in the airport. And I said to her, thank you for making the world more beautiful. Thank you. So even the most making the world more beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. And she was just so happy to hear this. So even if you are just sweeping the floor, if you are thinking, I am making this world beautiful to please Krishna. And you are, you know, studying philosophy. I am bringing truth to the world to please Krishna. So the Varnas and Ashramas help give us some support for Bhakti. And Bhakti then can infuse the Varnas and the Ashramas. Okay, so both yes, work synergistically then, to some extent. Brahma, Arpanam, Brahma. Beautiful, yeah. Yeah. That's true. And then there's not, then you can't even just feel this your Varna and sitting and chanting is your Bhakti. Fighting on the battlefield also becomes your Bhakti. The iron rod and the fire. Hmm. So initially, there has to be some amount of... Uh, clear-headed understanding of both and engagement in both. And then over a period of time, both will sort of interface and interact more and more. And then our whole life will become, we could say, more spiritualized, more centered on Correct. Pressure. Correct. But if initially we don't have that categorization, then we sort of neglect our Varana and Ashram entirely. Then that could lead to a, a artificial or premature transcendence, which won't be sustainable. Correct. We have seen that hundreds of times. Hmm. Unless you're at the beginning of Satya Yuga. If you're at the beginning of Satya Yuga, there's no varnas, no ashrams. Hmm. Even a little bit into Satya Yuga, we start seeing varnash. At the very beginning, everyone is hamsa. There, there's no, the trees are giving fruits, the ground is giving vegetables, the weather is always nice. There's no need of livelihood. Oh, and there was no need of, you see, and there was no need of ashram. Well, that's, that's a deep thing to think about. But there was no need of, there was no brahmachari, grahasta, vanaprasta, and sannyas. There was no brahman, satri, vaishya, Everyone was hamsa. Mm, I think that's too utopian a situation to even uh, compare with today's world. We can understand in principle. Exactly. That, yeah. It, 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 did, it doesn't even last for the whole Satya Yuga. It's only the beginning of Satya Yuga. So if we think that we are now in 2021, that we are going to create some something that only exists for a short time at the beginning of Satya Yuga, I, I don't think that that's reasonable. Okay. That makes sense. So maybe... And yeah. my, my personal conviction is that one of the most important ways we can bring Krishna consciousness to the world is especially in this realm of Varna Dharma. Because everybody has to live. Everybody has to maintain themselves. Everyone has a nature that wants expression. Everyone wants to have a way of maintaining themselves that makes them feel happy and fulfilled. And the principles of Varna Dharma include Yajna. They include connection with the Lord. They include uh, acting without ego. Bhagavad Gita 330. Mm. And so, you know, if we go to everyone and say, why don't you worship God? They'll say, oh, and, and later. Or if we go to people in the world, why don't you worship a blue God playing his flute and herding cows? You know? <laughs> but if we say, would you like to learn how to be, how to have peace and prosperity? how to correct the imbalance of values, have a, how to have a satisfying life where you can work according to your nature in a way that brings you genuine prosperity and fulfillment. Who will say no to this? Mm, that is true. Now, just imagine the, opposite. imagine the opposite, that we say to people, take up Krishna consciousness and at least half the population will lead lives of frustration, repression, 
and not being able to express themselves in a way that they can find peace and prosperity. And we can't really tell, we can't really falsify people's lived experience. You say, no, this will actually, living in this way will make you prosperous if they have felt inhibited living in a particular way. That means choosing their ashram or varana. You sh- because you have a particular gender, you should be happy in this way. We cannot really mandate happiness in that sense. We have to no. We have to actually engage and naturally when people are engaged, they'll feel happy. That's true. If I say that you should do Russell's work and he should do your work because I've mandated it and you have to be happy doing each other's work. Hmm. That's so true. That was just because, I, because I've just decided. Look, I'm, I'm really going to go out on a limb here and, and be racist. And I'm going to say, okay, you're brown. You should be doing that kind of work. And he's white. He should be doing that kind of work. Hmm. Is that is that real? Well, somehow, I mean, that, bec- that racism becomes a very big issue. But I'm saying, what you're saying in principle is that just as we wouldn't, we couldn't decide a person's person's social role simply based on their physical complexion, so we can't decide it simply based on their gender also. So exactly. I, I mean, we'll just we'll discuss this one last point, and we could. I'll try to summarize because I don't want to take too much of your time also. So earlier you said that we, we, there's one way of classifying societies by varanas. And, and in that sense, that in each varana, there will be males and females. And there is another right. way of classifying, you could say, society based on gender. So there are generic, generic duties or generic propensities or whatever word we want to use, internal propensities, external duty activities. There are some generic activities for males and generic activities for females. And there are generic, there are activities for each varana. So what happens sometimes is that the varana specification is, is considered only for males and only the gender specification is considered for females. But we could say that while there's the gender specific roles for women do need to be emphasized because in today's world, they are being sometimes demon, uh, de- uh, they, are, they are being minimized or trivialized. And I know I read in one place, I have a, some devotee sent me a link, is it that this woman, she doesn't have any children. And she says, I am a child free woman. I thought that is, is, it, is that really freedom? What kind of freedom is that? Okay, I mean, you don't want to, we don't want to label or condemn anyone for that. But it's almost like she's rejected her ashram from your analysis perspective and she's proud of that. And maybe it's so. It is uh, the, we want to, because the, the ashram role of women, the gen, now I'm not sure whether ashram is the right word over here because ashram talks about stages within a life. But it's more like gender specific duties, you could say, that there are gender specific duties and there are varana specific duties. So quite often, the gender-specific duties for women are emphasized because they, uh, in, in our tradition or in general, in tr- most traditional societies or even traditionally inclined societies, where because to some extent in today's world, they are being de-emphasized. So, but if I understand right, what you are saying is that just as there are, tradi- there are certain duties for females, there are certain duties for males also. But just as the males can do their duties of, of say, like, providing for the family while taking care of their varana. So similarly, even women can do their gender specific duties while taking care of, while also having space for their varana. Am I phrasing what you said earlier, right? Or you would like to elaborate? Yes, yes. In other words, both males and females, and Bhagavatam includes eunuchs. So males, females, and eunuchs, they ha- we have certain propensities, and these things all have to be in balance. Prabhupada says we should have a balance of values. We don't want to be imbalanced. A man who's always working and never spends time with his family will die with regret. Sorry, a I... woman who's only with her family, a man who's only with his family, with his work and not with his family, he will die with regret. Yes. And a woman who's only takes care of her family and never engages in her other propensities will also die with regret. Oh, 
Okay. We are holistic beings. We're, we're not one dimensional beings. Yeah. And we may do no, a and ashram perfectly, but if there's no bhakti, even then we'll die with regret against ultimately. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And for most people, if they try to do only bhakti without varna and ashram, they won't be able to do it. Some people can do that, but most people that's cannot. Difficult. Yeah, that's very difficult. I agree. So that means we now you give the example of that's saving. possible. That's possible. It is possible to do only bhakti. And no varna and ashram duties. That is possible. But for most people, that will come later in life. Mm. True. If they go through the system of ashrams and they have the proper varna according to their propensity, then by mid or late life, those desires will be satisfied. Yeah. And they will be able just to do bhakti and not do any varna and ashram. And a tiny fraction of people can do only bhakti from the beginning and never need the support of varna and ashram. True. And, uh, but the other way, varna and ashram without bhakti, shrama evihi kevala. Hmm. And if a person only has ashram or only has varna, unbalance, difficulty, social breakdown, a mess. That's so true. So in one sense, you mentioned this point also earlier, maybe we can conclude with this, that with the pandemic and the lockdown, in many ways, the harmonization of Varana and Ashram has started happening, not just for women, even for men. Like many men, there is a phenomenon in America, they call it the great resignation now, where people don't mm -hmm. just don't want to go back to jobs which are eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, whatever per day and per week. So if I can work from home, and let me do this. So there are even men, what to speak of women, are also feeling the need that, you know, do we need this kind of consuming job so much? So to some extent, this pandemic might be like a corrective or at least open the doorway or open the thinking for a corrective. But each individual might need some creative thinking to find out in my situation how I can manage Varana and Ashram both. Correct. And again, I see, you know, reviving the fact that humans... A lot of unemployment is caused by machines. And the unemployment caused by machines has made it so that we don't have as much help in our life. So the, reviving the extended family, reviving the very honorable career of being a servant. And reviving the idea of working from home and family businesses and family working together and children learning skills at home going in those directions, which simple living helps. You can do it in a city. Vedic society had cities too. It's not that we're opposed to all cities, but simple living helps. It helps having an extended family. It helps if you grow some of your own food. It helps if you have careers that are connected to the land. Hmm. Yes, that's wonderful. So, Russell, do you want to comment some things? No, nah, no, nah, you've covered it really very well. Thank yeah. you. So, are they excellent. Sure, thank you. So, Mata, you would like to add Please. something, or should I try to summarize? I, I, I think, I think we've, I think you've summarized well, and um, I, I'd like to end by saying that if you don't know where you're going, you're probably not going to get there, and we need to have a vision of if the whole world were properly situated in Krishna consciousness, what would it look like? What would society look like? How would everyone be happy and satisfied? How would there be peace and prosperity? That's An ideal point. society is not one of frustration. It's not one of imbalance. It's not one of artificiality. It's a society where things are natural with the laws of nature, natural with the laws of God where people get to be who they are, the best expression of who they are in the service of the Lord. Beautiful, best expression of who they are. And that's true on this, in this temporary life with our temporary false identity. And it's true eternally. Mm, it's the best expression of who we are yeah, a, in the service. 
Yeah, it's a very affirmative way of looking at ourselves. <clears throat> but it's something like I read one quote by one. I think a Christian author, a Christian author, I think says, "Who we are is God's gift to us. Who we become is our gift to God." Very so, nicely put. Yeah, that's true. And this should be our our idea with everyone to help everyone be the best expression of who they are in a temporary sense and in an eternal sense in the service of the Lord. Beautiful. Of who they are, not who we think they ought to be, but who they are. Hmm. True. Be the expression. So in one sense, it's like, a, it's like a joint exploration for that individual along with their guides and well-wishers to find out who they are also. So it's not a yes by themselves. It's not even just their hunch because one's own moods and one's own ideas also keep changing. It may take some time to discover also who they essentially are from a psychophysical nature. Yes, hmm. correct. Yes. And to realize that who I am from a psychophysical nature that's never going to fully satisfy me. I also have to discover who I am on a spiritual level. Yeah. And then we need guidance to become the best version of who we are. Hmm. Because one could be a corrupt Brahmana and a corrupt Vaishya and a corrupt Satri and a corrupt Sutra. So to discover who I am and then be the best version, to be the Dharmic version of that. That's wonderful. And then do that, then do that for God. Yes. Do that out of love for Krishna. Hmm. And if you know, if we did this people would be lining up to join our society. We wouldn't be able to take care of all of them. Lining up to join our society. That was a wonderful way of putting it. Mm. Well, if are in the service of the whole, in the service of God, in the service of Krishna, so that you would feel completely satisfied. And if we had career guidance centers to help people discover their varnas and marriage guidance centers to help people have a compatible marriage, imagine that. Yeah, that's so huge. And if we then envisioned, yeah, and then if we envisioned a society where where your your family life, your biological necessities, and your livelihood, your fear, your psychological necessities, your engagement in bhakti are all balanced and in harmony and infusing each other, and everyone was like, and everyone was doing work that they loved. And that was an expression of their of the best expression of themselves. Imagine. That's a wonderful vision. Thank you. I mean, how that vision could be actualized could also be another whole discussion. But it's such an inspiring vision to have. It's we're not just not just talking about say going back to the spiritual world with Krishna. We can also envision a much, much more, uh, much more beautiful world in this world also. Yes. Yeah. The descriptions in Shastra, the Krishna conscious worlds. You know, when Ram is, is the king, yeah. it's a world of peace and prosperity and where everybody is engaging in something that's suitable for them in the service of the Lord. Mm. And it's what's suitable for you. It's it was suitable for you. It was suitable for you. And it's, mm. yeah. and everyone has their place and, and people feel energized by being in their, in their proper place. True. So let's just let me quickly summarize. You have already entered those points, but uh, I'll take three, four minutes to summarize. If that's okay with you. Mm. So we started, we discussed broadly today about how the Varana and Ashram can be harmonized in today's world. So initially discussed of how Shla, several quotes from Prabhupada and several examples from Shastra of how women were also engaged in Varana activities, both contemporary with weavers and traditional with the gopis themselves going to Mathura to sell cow products. Uh, so then, so this is how it was going on. But with the Industrial Revolution, three things happened. Major, that the work went out of the home. And then the because people located wherever the industries were, relocated. So then the joint family structure got disrupted. And then, Servants were left by, left replaced by machines, but the machines could not do everything. So, in that sense, the 
women who might have been weavers who might have been artists who might have been farmers who were taking care of their families also contributing the pro- uh, profession they had to choose between varana and ashram and they were forced in one sense biology forced them to choose varana sorry choose ashram and before that actually we discussed that do women have their own varana so through the scriptural examples also the understanding that if a woman is going to get married to a man then she unless her varana is known and now today it has degenerated to jati to the birth uh, birth race or birth caste but if they were of a compatible if they are of the same varana then they could naturally work together and if the whole concept of anulom and pratilom means that a woman has a varana which is not compatible with the husbands and that was considered quite important that even a progeny a child even a son was identified sometimes more with the varana of the mother than of the father if the two were different like romarshan suit and others examples now so women do have their varana and then in the past they could harmonize their varana and ashram together but the industrial revolution post industrial revolution society forced them to choose ashram or varana because if they have any children they have to take care of those children and the job requires them to go far away from home it is just not possible and that's went on but that created so one side the varana side was being repressed and that went on and multiple things happened till say you used to talk about the the contraception in 1920s and then the birth control pill and then abortion becoming legalized so by that they could control their ashram duties in the sense they could control how many children they would have if at all they would want to have any children and then they chose varana over ashram and in the modern narrative of uh, mainstream society the freedom to choose varana over ashram as compared to being forced to choose ashram over varana that is considered like a liberation or emancipation of women but th- that's a limited framework if you go even to have to choose between the two itself is a restriction so the real the solution is not that women uh, when women choose only varana over ashram then that leads to neglect of children that leads to again neglect because a part of them is taking care of taking care of children and that is also lost and for men also they pursue varana so that they can take care of their ashram and without the impetus of taking care of family then many women, men also don't become very ambitious they don't grow up they don't get, develop, take responsibility and then without children if children are uncared for or children are not born only then the whole human society can get disrupted so the way ahead for us today would be you give several examples even of your granddaughter who is an artist and she is doing art is devotional art while she has an extended family support to take care of her children at that time so there are devotees can find situations or varanas which allow that which go along with their ashram and there could be many examples of how this could be done and especially the lockdown during the pandemic and the working from home has opened new horizons and new perspectives so maybe that could take us back to the a more harmonious way of looking at things and when prabhupad talked strongly about what about the need for uh, uh, he talked strongly about how women's biology biological difference and how they would have children and then they would have to either kill the child or beg for support so the point was not he didn't want to take women back to the 1920s pre 1920s it was that more towards the vedic standard where varana and ashram are harmonized and thank you if we simply take it to 1920s then half half of the population will feel unfulfilled and that's not that's not what god would want that's not what shastra would want that's not natural and if you can balance both so that will require some creativity that will some thinking and then of course one way society could be better ordered is if marriages happen earlier and marriages happen with the man and woman being of the same varana then they can both build a family together and then build their career or their profession also together so but if they wait for a long time to uh, marriages happen later then both of them have developed their own career they have gone through multiple relationships and there's so much agony because of that and then to come together and have a stable marriage also becomes difficult and uh, ultimately it's not just satisfying our varana and our ashram but also you want to satisfy the uh, the spiritual side of us so that is the we bhakti is there so we need time for our bhakti and then we need time for our varana, balancing our varana and ashram and overall 
Krishna's uh, purpose is ultimately we want to go back to Krishna, but we help each other within our movement to become the best version of who we are. And there, there could be some indications of a, if a parents are observant from even from the early age of three, four, there could be some indications of who a child, what a child's varana is. But by the age of 13, 15, by careful observations, a fair amount of indication can come out. And that way, they can be engaged according to their varana. And that's the way, ultimately, Krishna wants all us. It's not just Krishna wants to satisfy our spiritual pur- purpose, vidyamcha avidyamcha, as the Shopishad you quoted. Now, Prabhupada emphasized the spiritual because people were completely obsessed with the materialistic at that time. But Prabhupada also gave us a tradition which balanced the material and the spiritual. And there are many quotes of Prabhupada also which balance the material and the spiritual. So this has been an insightful and uh, let's say eye-opening kind of discussion. So thank you very much. You want to add any last points? Either it's something I left out or something I Perfect. want to add? Perfect. Thank you very much. I look forward to having you for many more podcasts oh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Russell Prabhu also. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.